Lord, I'm ready for a change. Only you can make me change. So we continue today with a sermon series about making changes. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked at what it means to choose change and how sometimes change can be a scary choice to make. We need courage, the courage that God provides to us, the courage that is always available if we just reach out and take it, and the courage that then helps us make changes in our lives. Now, we had a moment in our service where you had an opportunity to write a change challenge on a slip of paper, something in your life that you uh, have the power to change, you have control over it, but maybe need a little help, maybe need some divine help in making that change, and you were invited to bring and bring those cha change challenges and put them in the basket, and they have been here on the altar since then, and I have been coming up on a regular basis and praying over these and praying that you are drawing on the courage that God provides to you and gives to you to make this challenge something that you can put behind you. But today... We're going to look at recognizing when we need to make a change and recognizing when we are in a rut. And so what exactly is a rut and why is it bad to be in a rut? So let's start with a little pop quiz. What's the difference between a rut and a routine. Mm, think about it for a minute. What is the difference between having a routine that you follow and when does that routine flip over to be a rut? Well, very simply put, one is helpful, the other is not. Now, routines are good. They help us develop habits that, in turn, help us to do something. I mean, we get a routine. We're pretty much in a routine, most of us, from the time we wake up in the morning. And the, that routine usually involves several things. I would imagine, I know mine does, the first is a trip to the bathroom. The second is a crying puppy now. That was a change to my routine. But there are certain things that we have to do in the, in the morning to prepare us for the day. I certainly hope brushing your teeth is part of your routine in the morning. I certainly hope some kind of personal hygiene is part of your routine in the morning. I can see that putting on clothes is a routine for all of you. Routines are something we generally don't mind. They help us. They help us achieve a purpose. Ruts, however, are something that we are in. And when we are in a rut, we're usually stuck. We're not going anywhere. We are just in that rut, and chances are you're probably not happy to be there. Now, sometimes it's easy to recognize when you are in a rut but other times, ruts can disguise themselves as routine. So how do you tell the difference? Back in 2017, the magazine Psychology Today published an article by Tanya Luna where she lays out some symptoms, some signs that you might be in a rut. And so using some of her ideas, I'm going to do a spinoff on Jeff Foxworthy's You Might Be a Redneck. Okay, today, here's, you might be in a rut. If you don't look forward much, forward too much of anything other than maybe sleeping or just getting through whatever you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, you might be in a rut. If 
by the time you do get some free time, you don't do anything interesting with it or you're just plain unmotivated to do anything. You might be in a rut. If everyone, including yourself, is tired of hearing you complain about feeling stressed or tired or unfulfilled, you might be in a rut. Even though you think you'd be happier if you made a change, it's more comforting to stay the same and mope around about it, you might be in a rut. Now, ruts don't just affect our physical lives. They affect our spiritual lives as well. You know, it's really easy to get complacent in our relationship with God. We might even categorize our spiritual development as routine. So how do you know if your spiritual life is a routine or your spiritual life is in a rut? Here's the test. Are you growing? Are you going anywhere with your relationship with God? Is it something that you work on every day? If not, your spiritual routine might actually be a spiritual rut. Let's go to scripture. We're going to be in the gospel of John, or excuse me, the gospel of Mark today. And we're going to hear about an encounter between Jesus and the Pharisees. Now, usually these encounters between Jesus and the Pharisees were not very pleasant, at least for the Pharisees. Because Jesus was usually telling them something they were doing wrong, something that they didn't want to hear, something that would upset the power that they held. Now, the Pharisees, if you're unfamiliar with who these men were, they were the religious leaders of the Israelites. They were the ones who were knowledgeable about God's law, and they were supposed to teach it to everyone and make sure that those laws were followed. But in their zeal to make sure that the law was followed to the last letter, they missed some key characteristics of God. Mark chapter 2, verses 23, starts this encounter. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, the disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look what they are doing. Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, he's talking about the Pharisees, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Now let's cut the Pharisees a little slack. They had a job to do. And they were trying to do it. Since the time of Moses, the covenant between God and his chosen people, the Israelites... That covenant was maintained through the following of the law. 
613 of them to be exact. And these laws had anything to do with what foods were clean to eat, what to do if a person came into contact with blood, how a man was supposed to shave, what could and couldn't be done on the Sabbath, which is the law that is in question in today's scripture. Now, the Pharisees were responsible for making sure that atonement was made if these laws were broken. And if the laws weren't upheld, they feared that God would break his covenant with them. They tend to forget the fact that the Hebrew people had broken the covenant multiple times and multiple times, over and over again, and yet God was still faithful. God was there. But they were concerned with making sure that everyone else was following the letter of the law. The Pharisees were in a rut when it came to their understanding of Scripture. They didn't see that there was any other way other than how they knew to follow God's law. And by Jesus reminding them that King David, the most revered and respected Israelite king, entered the house of the high priest and ate bread that he wasn't supposed to eat, and then took that bread and gave it to his men, by him reminding the Pharisees that David had done that, he was calling into question their understanding of the law. Actually, he's not calling it into question. He's flat out telling them that they are wrong. What is more important on the Sabbath, to save a life or to let someone die? You're wrong, Pharisees. Well, that didn't go over very well. And it was just another list, item on the list of reasons that the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus. Of course, it also didn't help that he then tells them that he is Lord over the Sabbath. That was committing blasphemy, which was one of those 16, 613 laws that he wasn't supposed to do. But that's not the end of the debate, this whole thing over the bread. Jesus enters the synagogue and he finds this man with a withered hand. Now, we don't know exactly what is wrong with his hand, but it cripples him in some manner. And it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And so Jesus asked the Pharisees, what should he do? And there is silence. And first, he gets angry. Because at least if they had answered wrong, he would have been able to have a conversation with them. They just stood there silently. And Jesus gets angry. And we're told that he gets angry at the hardness of their heart. Now, another way to translate that phrase, hardness of heart, is stubborn obtuseness. Now, what does it mean to be obtuse? It means to be dull, not sharp, not quick or alert in perception and feeling or intellect. Jesus was hopeful that the Pharisees would see that healing a person was more important than upholding the Sabbath laws. But they didn't see that. Or rather, because of their stubborn obtuseness in making sure that the Sabbath laws were upheld, they refused to see that healing the man with the withered hand was more important than not working on the Sabbath. They were unwilling to see that God, or excuse me, they were unwilling to see that there was another way to interpret God's laws. And that unwillingness to see that put them in a rut. There were two distinct behaviors here that kept the Pharisees in that rut. First, they always did what they'd always done. And second, 
they continued to believe what they'd always believed. Those are the same behaviors that keep us in our ruts. We always do what we've always done, and we always believe what we've always believed. Let's split those up and look at them a little more closely. We always do what we've always done. Now that can work for some people if they continue to grow and they continue to learn from them. That's a routine. But once that growth stops, it becomes a rut. Why do people abandon diet plans? Because they get tired of eating the same food? Or what about exercise programs? They get tired of exercising in the same way. Or like the lady from Psychology Today said, they stick with it just so they have something to gripe and complain about. What does your spiritual life look like? Is it easier to always do what you've always done because anything more or different requires motivation? I'm so glad that all of you are here for worship this morning. But if this one hour time slot is the sum and total of your relationship with God, my friends, you're in a rut and you're missing out on so much more. We always believe what we've always believed. There's another way to say this. The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Now, why that's a catchy phrase, it's a very lazy way to look at the Bible because it doesn't challenge us to go deeper into God's word The Bible is a book, yes, but it is also God's living word, and it affects us. As we learn more about it, as we study it, as it becomes more of a part of who we are, we are changed by it. And as it changes us, we become more like it. Now, we could hear the story that I just read about the Pharisees and Jesus and and think, well, duh, of course Jesus should have healed the man. Why couldn't the Pharisees have seen that? But as we spend more time with the story, as we start to let it affect who we are, we can start to ask questions like, wow, am I a Pharisee? Is my heart hard? How am I being a Pharisee? The more that we spend with it, the more that it affects us. And if we are satisfied just to scratch the surface, to not go deeper into our understanding of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit in this book, then we might be in a rut. In fact, we're probably in a rut. Now, living our lives in a rut, whether it's physically or spiritually, is not how God desires for us to live. We heard Becky read from Colossians these words, While you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. Humanity was in a deep rut, the rut of death. And God sent Jesus to get us out of that rut, to have wholeness of life, to have fullness of life, to keep growing, to keep challenging ourselves. It was an expensive gift to pay, to give. So let's not repay God's generosity by allowing ourselves to get stuck in a rut. So if we are in a rut, how do we get out of it? 
Now there's plenty of gurus out there who will help you with the physical areas of your life that you might find yourself in a rut. I'm going to focus on how we get out of spiritual ruts. First, don't be afraid to try something new or different. Join a group. Come to Sunday school. A couple of weeks ago, I shared that plans are underway for a midweek Bible study group. When that starts, join it. Or start your own group. You can volunteer. You can start a prayer journal. Maybe your spiritual life right now only consists of worship on Sunday morning. Start a new routine. Start a daily time, even if it's just for a few minutes, to study the Bible and to pray. If you need something that help, to help you start that, pick up an upper room devotion book from the Welcome Center as you leave. If you're a techie person, there's all kinds of websites that will send you a daily devotion and Bible study on your, lo- on your phone or your tablet or your computer. The first thing to do when we're in a rut is to do something different. Second, you've got to keep at it. Developing a new habit, a new routine takes time. In my midweek motivation this week that you received, I think on Wednesday or Thursday, I talk about how today, in today's society, we don't like to wait for anything. We have devices and things that give us instant gratification. It's easier to resist change than to wait for it. There's an old joke about the person who prayed for patience. Lord, I want patience and I want it right now. Right now to us. And right now, in God's eyes, can be two different things. And when we don't get what we want, including instantaneous change in our lives, we give up. And we have to fight that. Because resistance to change is a weapon used by the enemy to keep us from God. Satan's sole purpose is to do everything within his power to keep us from getting closer to God. And our impatience in waiting for a change can be used against us. If we give up too quickly as we're trying to make changes, as we're trying to get out of ruts, he wins. So stick with it. Third, remember that there are Different ways of connecting with God. You can read poetry written about God. You can listen to music. You can hike. You can use art, like all of these new coloring, adult coloring books. I've got one that's, that's um, the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. You can use coloring like that. You can use prayer beads. How many of you sit down and have a conversation with God like you would a friend at a coffee shop? God, today really stunk. Let me tell you about it. Now, let me insert a disclaimer here. That shouldn't be your only way of connecting with God. Yes, you can connect with God in a boat out on Clinton Lake. But like anything, if that's the only way that you're meeting God, you can become in a rut. And yes, I know how dangerous I just treaded on blasphemy with the Clinton Lake analogy. Finally, enlist the help of others. Why do support groups work? Because they are full of people that are holding you accountable to what you should be doing 
or what you need to be doing. We use accountability groups for any other thing, any other number of things. Weight Watchers, AA, NA. Why don't we use them in our spiritual lives as well? Find a group of people or even just one person who is going to ask you how you're doing in your walk with God and is going to question and challenge you when you fall off of that path or get off track. We have this example in Scripture. Be a Timothy. To, to, excuse me. Um, be, be a Paul to a Timothy. Or be Timothy to a Paul. Find someone that you admire their spiritual walk and walk with them. There's a saying that you should be a Paul and you should be a Timothy to someone else. You should be a Timothy under someone else's guidance and you should also be a Paul to someone else who's following behind you. Being a mentor to someone else or being a mentee of someone is a wonderful way to make sure that you're doing what you should be doing. American novelist Ellen Glasgow has this quote. The only difference between a rut and the grave are the dimensions. Think about that for a second. The only difference between a rut and a grave is the dimension. Our ruts, if we continue to spin in them, get deeper the longer that we're in them. Turning that rut into a grave in which we die. My challenge to you today is get out of your ruts. Christ extends an invitation to fullness of life, a relationship with the God who makes all things new again. Please accept this invitation. Amen.